There's nothing like starting the week with a magnificent time lapse. Starting the week, you say? It must be a. Don't know if you saw the film where I bought this amazing pedal, it's linked above. So this week, I just wanted to have a bit of fun and incorporate this pedal into my workflow, come up with a track, a performance, something that's out of the box to satisfy my inner modular demons. So let's get down to the shed. And the object of this patch today was really just to have some fun. I knew there was a couple of things I really wanted to integrate into this setup. One was this new piano pedal, which I'll come to in a moment, my new Profit Rev 2. And when it came to the modular setup, Again, I just wanted to have some fun and I just went with the flow, which you can probably tell from my disgraceful organization of patch cables. This track is not gonna win any Mercury Awards. It really is just me having fun, you know, kind of going with my personal heritage of being a fan of stuff like Tangerine Dream. The heartbeat of this patch is very much the Metropolis. So we've got the, um, this is the Atlantis running. It's a bit of um, spring reverb on the Magneto. And then we've got these four heads. Now these aren't actually clocked at all. I find that the tap is, I don't know, it just creates more flams, which creates more body and volume, which I enjoy. I've got Maths doing a slow ramp, just changing the, uh, the kind of brightness, the shape of it. Um, and I, kind of as part of the live performance I attenuate that which is fun I'm also using a kind of sub subdivided uh, gate with this MCO oscillator here it's a very it's got also got a slow ramp on this skiff here which really brightens it up and almost gives it like a steel drum sound Slightly out of tune as well, but that's what I adore about modular. You'll hear it kind of really build up in a sec. There we go. That upper harmonic giving it the kind of steel drum sound. So I've also got, as I mentioned, lots of the, these, the, the gates from the Metropolis subdivided here uh, with the control voltage just duped over there. So I'm also driving this little pluck here. Also got a ramp in mass affecting the way the kind of the shape of this sounding so again if we go I've got it going into a bit of delay and then into a bit of reverb and again if we adjust the attenuation I've also got both sets of voices being sent into clouds via the mixer So I've got the gate going into the, the Moog with a fantastic pattern that I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna spoil the surprise yet on that one. What I'm really excited about is I've been able to use the Make Noise Rene. What I love about Make Noise is they're daunting to learn, but what I found is once you've learned them, the knowledge seems to stay in. So basically what this is doing is controlling the bass. So let's bring that up. This is on this separate mixer here. So I've got two axes, I've got basically, so I'm controlling the gate here, so you'll see it here, there are some gaps, but also I'm using the kind of control voltage of this axis to change the amount of shape. So you can hear it kind of opening and closing. And then on the y-axis, I've got the pitch. I'm also using my Profit Rev 2. Great kind of 80s sounds there. But I have to say the kind of the main event, the, the kind of centerpiece, is this uh, plus pedal, uh, which I demonstrated in that film above there. Um, I wanted to really put this to work. So, the signal path is through one, I think this microphone here, into the plus pedal, into this looping pedal, 
and into the reverb. The thinking is, is uh, with a looping pedal you can often hear the, the loop point, so if we're doing the reverb after the loop point it all kind of mixes into itself. And then I run around there and kind of get to work uh, with the bass line hopefully remaining pretty much in sync with the piano, but the piano is a very loose kind of ephemeral uh, part. I come back about halfway through the performance, put this back into record and create some dissonance. And that's basically it. Before I run this performance down, let us go across the pond to see what Sandy's been up to. Hi Christian, and Happy New Year. I'm going to be starting out the new year by building that uh, computer that I was talking about. So I thought I'd just quickly talk through some of the parts and the reasoning behind them, and then just jump straight into some of the build footage and talk about what went on and how that went together. So it's going to be quite a simple build really. And I thought I'd just talk through some of the typical components that you'll find in a PC build. So we have the case, which I've already installed the power supply into the bottom of. Now this is an NZXT H500i, uh, the I meaning that it has some uh, built-in controls for fans and for some flashy lighting. And in the bottom I've built in the Corsair RM850X, which is a fully modular power supply. Um, fully modular in this case meaning that the different power cables can be plugged in as you need them so you don't end up with any unused cables kind of just sitting around doing nothing in there. It's much easier for cable management and for making it tidier, for better airflow and so on. So moving on to the main guts of what I'm going to use, uh, this is going to be built around the uh, AMD 2700X which at the time of recording is the top of the range in the Ryzen processors uh, without getting into the sort of server stuff like the Threadripper. So this is a 8-core, 16-thread processor, uh, which clocks in at 4.3 gigahertz. So it's got good uh, single-core performance, but for some of the multi-threading stuff, it's going to be really powerful. 16 gigabytes of G-Scale RAM. Uh, I've gone for faster RAM, but there's not a great deal of it. The reason for that is, at the time of recording, uh, RAM prices are actually hugely inflated right now. So for a sample library-based system, if you're going to be using a lot of large sample libraries and so on, uh, I definitely recommend more RAM than 16 gigabytes, uh, but I plan to expand on this to 32 or 64 once RAM prices kind of calm down a little bit. I have an SSD. This is an M.2 uh, NVMe SSD from Intel, uh, which is 512 gigabytes, and I plan to install my operating system and my core software on there. And then as and when I expand to some of the sample libraries and so on, I'll get some other internal storage. I'll wait until they're a little bit cheaper and then probably stick some one terabyte or two terabyte SSDs in here. For now, it's worth noting that there are two different kinds of M.2 uh, SSD you can get. There's some that use uh, what's called PCIe, and then there's some that use SATA. And SATA has a much smaller bandwidth. So for things like operating systems, to get the absolute best out of the SSD, I'd recommend getting a PCIe or NVMe drive. So that's what I've gone for here. It's not a particularly pretty looking component, but it's going to be hidden away inside and I'll show you how in just in a while. Now for music production, this isn't hugely important, but this is going to be a gaming rig as well. And I'm going to do some video editing and various other bits and pieces on it. So I've got the, again, this is an AMD Sapphire Nitro Plus Radeon RX 580. Not quite the very top of the range uh, AMD card in their consumer stuff, but it's good enough for 1080p gaming. And of course, more importantly, for some video editing and so on as well. And it's also worth noting that uh, regardless of whether or not you're going to be doing any gaming, if you're using a Ryzen 2700X, you'll need some kind of graphics card because it doesn't have any onboard graphics, even if the motherboard does. The last component I've got here is my Asus uh, Prime X470 Pro. Just a really nice, simple, uh, not overly expensive motherboard, which has all of the features that I need. It's got the right chipset for the Ryzen. It's got an M.2 socket for the boot drive and some nice heat sinks and so on built into it. Um, and it also supports uh, all the hardware that I've got. Now, if you're unsure of any of the hardware and compatibility, so for instance, if you've got a particular drive or graphics card in mind or a case in mind um, and you're not sure about which part to go for, I definitely recommend PC Part Picker. Uh, it's a site where you can basically put in your shopping list, as it were, and it will tell you if there's any compatibility issues. A couple of other things to mention. I've got a bootable USB drive for Windows 10, which is what I'm going to be installing. And I've got an anti-static wrist strap. Uh, if you don't see me wearing this in some of the shots on my wrists, it's usually because I'm wearing it around my ankle just to keep it out of the way. Um, but when you're handling things like a processor or a graphics card and so on, uh, it's very, very handy. And indeed, if you're doing some of the soldering with um, digital ICs and so on, recommend one of these. You can get a pack of three on Amazon for like seven quid. Uh, so it's it's worth worthwhile investing in. Okay, so our first step is to get our motherboard out and get our CPU installed. 
So we just lift the retention arm on the side of the CPU socket here. And you'll notice there's lots of little holes on this. And in the top right, there's a little triangle at the top right as we're looking at it, that is. And this so that you can align the CPU correctly on the socket. And I'm just very gently and carefully lowering that into the socket. And once I'm convinced it's secure and that the arrow corresponds to the triangle in the corner of the socket, I just pull the retention arm back down and then pop it into place. So that's not going anywhere. It's nice and snug. Next up, we unscrew and remove our M.2 heatsink. And I'm just pointing out the cover on the thermal pad there. That's very important to make sure that gets taken off before we install the uh, heatsink again. I'm um, just installing a little standoff here because M.2 drives come in lots of different sizes. So you just need to place the standoff corresponding to the size of your drive. The drive itself is very small and like I say, it's not particularly exciting to look at. But it installs a little bit like laptop RAM does. So you place it in and then uh, once you're happy it's in place, you just use the screws that came with your motherboard um, to secure it horizontal with the standoff. And then I stick the M.2 heatsink back on and just tighten up the screws on there. Making sure not to over tighten. Uh, you don't want these things to seize up. You want to be able to get at them if you ever need to remove the drive. Next, we're going to install our RAM. Uh, there's four slots on this, but reading the instruction manual, the gray slots on mine are the ones to use. Check your motherboard instruction manual to make sure you use the correct slots. And you'll notice on the RAM slots here, there's a little divot or a little notch, and that corresponds to the notch on the RAM DIMM itself. Uh, there's only one way that this can be plugged in, so just be careful to plug it in correctly. Next up, we're going to install our CPU cooler. I'm using the stock cooler for now. I may update it in future if I feel I need to, um, but I've heard that the uh, Prism Wraith coolers for the Ryzen's are very good and very quiet. These just hook on. I haven't applied any thermal paste in my video because this actually comes with the thermal paste pre-applied. But if you're using a third-party cooler or an Intel processor, then make sure to put some thermal paste on there as per the instructions. Uh, we just turn this little lever and it takes quite a bit of force. It can be a little bit spooky or a little bit scary if it's your first time installing a CPU cooler because it's quite a firm lever. But once that's installed, we just uh, plug in the fan headers and we've got a little fan controller, which you can see at the top here. And I've got all of these different uh, cable management channels on the back of the case. So just spend a little bit of time making sure that your cables are routed correctly and uh, neat and tidy as they can be. Uh, it just makes it much easier for when you start to come to plug things in, like your USB 3 sockets and your front panel audio and all these sorts of things. I've got the I.O. shield that came with the motherboard installed in the back there. And then we just lower our motherboard into place to fit into that. And we give it a little bit of a sort of shimmy around until it fits on the standoff in the middle of the motherboard. And then there are eight screws uh, on a typical ATX motherboard like this. Um, so we just carefully install each of these screws. Uh, this is a good example of when you should use a magnetic screwdriver. This is quite fiddly without one, um, as I learned to my peril. So I'm just pointing out the eight different places that the screws go. And next, I'm just removing the PCIe expansion slot covers and then installing the graphics card in the first PCIe lane. I've sped this up a little bit because it's not the most exciting part of the process. And now I've got all of the power cables plugged in as per the instructions that came with each of the components. And I've also plugged in my front panel audio and my uh, front panel connectors and so on. So I'm just going to pop the tempered glass side panel back on again. This actually gets held in place with just the thumb screw and then I switch it on and it comes to life. And to be honest with you, the default RGB lighting on all of these components are pretty hideous. Until I get Windows installed, it's kind of rainbow vomit colors. But that's it, it's all up and running, it all posted correctly. But let me know if you want to uh, hear a little bit more about the software I'll be installing or how to go about installing it or getting it set up once Windows is installed. Thanks, Sandy, as always, for your contribution. Uh, can't wait to see how this all shapes up over the next forthcoming weeks. Right, down to the shed for this performance.
Thanks as always for watching. If you haven't subscribed yet, please do. Uh, I've got one more piece of kit to go in before I create this truly out of the box system. So it's gonna be interesting to watch that getting plumbed in. If you like this video, one of those for Sandy and I would be great. And if you'd like to be notified the next time we put a video up, just ding that bell. See you next week, bye.